Um, last week I read this story to you in John chapter 9, and I don't like to do the same thing over and over again, but I want to make sure, just, uh, I, don't, I know we're adding length, uh, but we also want to make sure we add clarity and depth to our time together, and so to do that, I think it's best to reread the story, and I know it's a lot of verses, but please, let's just do that so we can get as much out of this as we can. We chose to come, right? So let's get the most out of it while we're here. Um, if you don't have a Bible uh, or a device, a phone, or whatever you use, there's plenty of Bibles around. There's orange ones, there's yellow ones. Please put your eyes on God's Word, the page that we're going to be reading. It's up there. That corresponds with those Bibles. So we'll give you a minute to get there, and then, uh, then we'll read together, okay? Like I said, we're going to finish up this story. Last week, I think we only did the first couple of verses, maybe three or four verses. Um, and then I'm going to, this week, we're going to do the rest of the story. Paul Harvey, right? The rest of the story. And then we're going to wrap it up next week, and then we'll start the book of Romans. All right, you guys all there? You're all there? Okay, John chapter 9, uh, starting in verse 1. Here we go. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi's disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, say who? He spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, the spread, then spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told them, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed, came and came back seeing. I'm having trouble seeing. It, it's great. I like right eye and I'm blind right here right now. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. They asked, who healed you and what happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Where is he now, they asked. I don't know, he replied. Then, he then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees, these are the religious leaders that ran the, the synagogues, the temples, the churches of the day. No, it was. Because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it. So he told them, he put the mud over my eyes, then I washed it away, and I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man, Jesus, is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. Others said, but how can an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, uh, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? The, the man replied, I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man who had been blind and could now see, so they called in his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son, and that he was born blind. But we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said to this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said, he was old enough, ask him. For this, so for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. I don't know whether he's a sinner, the man replied, but I know this. I was blind, and now I can see. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man explained, I told you once. Didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they cursed him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Why, that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from? We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he's ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone who <coughs> blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to 
to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. Been there, done that, guys. Y'all know what I mean. Uh, Matthew 28, Jesus makes a statement that created this whole series. It's the Great Commission. He says that all of authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now go. He says, I'm the boss. I'm in charge of everything. Now go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them all that I taught you. And trust me here, guys, I'm going to be with you the whole time. Paraphrase. But that's what he says. So here's the thing. That's what we've, we're trying to study that for 20 weeks. Like, does Jesus really have all authority? Do, 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 I mean, does he really have all authority? See, that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Does he have authority really, or is it just talk? We have to make, personally, a decision on Christ. Let me tell you something. You can, no one can leave Jesus just hanging out there. You have to make a decision on Jesus. Every single person on earth has to make a decision about Jesus. Okay? I was taught this. When I was wondering, as many of you may be, about who Jesus really is. And you're curious, and that's why you're here. I was wondering too, and so this guy that led me to Christ eventually, he said this to me. He said, uh, Moses, what do you think about Jesus? And I said, well, you know, I'm a Jewish guy, right? So I don't believe in him, but I, I believe this. He was a good teacher. A lot of people think that, right? He's a good teacher. Taught good things. Good, good guy. Did good stuff. And he says, uh, do you have any kids? And I said, yes. He said, all right, let me ask you a question. If you went to, to parent or like student or parent orientation day at the school, and you went up and you said, uh, hi, I'm Mr. Robbins, and you went up to the teacher and you said, hi, I'm Mr. Ryan, I'm God. What would you do? Now, I say that because the scriptures are clear. That, that book that we read and we believe is truth, that tells us that Jesus is God. So, so, so if you go up to a guy and he says, hi, I'm Ryan and I'm God, you, you got to make some, you have to make a choice, right? You, you can't, what am I saying? I, I'll say this. I can't call him a good teacher if he says he's God unless he really is God. Because if he's not God, I'm going to think he's either a whack job or a liar. Or I need to bow to him, right? There's no choices. There's no other choices. <laughs> That, that's it. You've got to make a decision on Jesus. Every single one of us has to make a decision on Jesus. A proper perspective of Jesus solves everything. It gives us purpose in life. It gives us hope for eternity. It gives us a reason to wake up in the morning. Everything about life is all wrapped up in who Jesus really is. Okay? And so that's what we've been trying to do through this series. Some of us are believers already, and we go through the miracles, and we say, man, if he can walk on water and calm a storm and multiply food and raise dead people, then he can surely help me with my funk that I'm in right now. So that's good for you. That's awesome. But if you're not a believer, right, the real purpose behind this me message series was not necessarily to encourage the believer. It's to tell the person who has not chosen yet who Jesus is to them. This should clarify it for them. It should give them every, every bit of information that they need. So we've spent like 20 weeks going through miracle after miracle after miracle with Jesus. And the reason why we're doing this is because after we get done, it should allow Jesus to, to sit on two thrones. Two thrones. The first throne is the throne of the universe. King of all kings. The Lord of lords. Like... The guy in charge of stars and planets and things of that nature, right? The big stuff. He should sit, throne one is the throne of the universe. But here's the thing. When I say, does he really have authority? Here's the, here's the other one. It's throne two. It's your throne. The throne of your heart. And if he may be the master of the universe. He may rule over the stars, the planet, the weather, the lightning, all that. But it, does he rule over you? Is he the Lord of your life? I would say, and myself included, at very best, I want him to be the Lord of my life. But I have not got there yet. He truly is the Lord of my life. You know why? Because when he tells me to do stuff, I don't listen. Is he the Lord of my life? If, if he tells me what to do and I say no, is he the Lord of my life? Treading on thin ice there, man. You, may, you can decide what you want with that. But I would say that our very best day, we're 
hoping he is. We're asking that he is. We want him to be. So let's talk about these two thrones. Let's start right here in our text. Let's see what we can glean from this. I would say the first thing as we pursue these thrones and where does Jesus sit? Let's say the first thing here. Look at verse 17 and I'll say this. Here's my, here's my claim. Let's see if, we, if the text supports it. Public opinion on Jesus means nothing. Public opinion on Jesus means nothing. Look here in verse uh, 16. Some of the Pharisees said, This man, Jesus, is not from God. He, for he's working on the Sabbath. Others said, uh, But how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Verse 17. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded that talking to this guy. They said, What's your opinion about this man? Who healed you? Let me just tell you what, a little bit about opinions, okay? They're unsubstantiated statements. They're unsubstantiated position. There's no proof for it. There's no foundation under it. You're just making stuff up. It's what you think. Let me tell you what, what happened. Here's the deal, okay? It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. Okay? Jesus stands apart from your opinion. He's not included in your opinion, okay? So throne, throne two. I would say is the most important throne of all. Why? The reason why it's the most important throne to you and me is because it decides every moment for the rest of our eternity. Where Jesus sits on your throne determines from that moment on for the rest of eternity, millions and millions of years forever. So that's the most important thing. But here's the thing, to pick a throne, to pick a king for your throne, you want to answer the throne one question first. Because you want to make sure that the, the guy that sits on your throne can't be dethroned by anybody else. Do, do you know what I'm saying? You don't want somebody else's king to be able to beat up your king. Because then your king is insufficient. It's, it's like being on the, on the playground and you're getting ready to do a pickup game. And you got all these guys out there playing, right? And then there's Michael Jordan. <laughs> no brainer, right? Who are you going to pick? The second best guy? The third best guy? The guy who looks like Michael Jordan? The one who's wearing Air Jordans? Or are you going to pick Michael Jordan? Right? Because he's undoubtedly the best basketball player that's ever lived. So that's the one you want on your throne. Right? So you want to have, you need to figure out who's on throne one so you can determine who should be on throne two. And in a culture of religious tolerance and political correctness that shoves universal thinking of there's tons of gods and tons of ways and buffet religions, okay? In that culture, somebody has to stand up for Jesus and speak some truth, okay? So I would say this. Jesus Christ, talking of throne one, the universe, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Christ existed before anything was created, is supreme over all creation, because everything was created by him and for him. And that Jesus holds all creation together. And that, Je and that Jesus, although God, humbled himself and came to the earth that he created, became human and dwelt among us. And that God in all of his fullness was pleased to dwell in Christ. Jesus Christ sits on throne one. He is the king of the universe. His authority extends over life, over death, over sickness, over nature, over all of the universe. And my opinion or anyone else's opinion will not and cannot change that. Jesus Christ is God. And that's it. Okay, someone has to stay. So we don't have to have this anymore, this garbage about, well, I just believe. What do you think about Jesus? Well, well I believe that. That's, that's garbage, okay? That's garbage. If people want to, to cuss you out and tell you you're closed-minded because you think you know the truth, tell them thank you. Jesus Christ is Lord and God of the universe. And you have to stand on that. If you say, well, I just believe that. You know what you're saying? That there's a possibility that I'm wrong. Because I believe this. But you can believe what you want, and then we'll all be happy in heaven together. Okay, and that's just not going to fly. Like, we don't have to call people of differing point of views or opinions. We don't have to call them stupid, even though they are. You don't have to call them stupid. But what's wrong with actually standing on what you believe to be true? And saying that it's not just what you believe, it's the truth. Why can't we do that? Why can't we do that? Politically correct 
belongs in the dumpster where it came from. Well, it came from probably a different place. It smells just as bad. Okay, and we need to stand firm on what we believe, okay? So if Jesus Christ sits on throne one as the king of the universe, then it should be sort of easy to determine who should be on throne two, which is your heart, your life, okay? But it's never been really, really easy, ever, 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 ever. It's not easy now. It hasn't been easy back then, okay? I need to look something up on my phone while I'm talking to you. And this is not me texting, you know, looking up a verse. Right. I want to read something out of uh, the non-inspired version, the NIV. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all never heard that before, the NFB, the non-inspired version? This phone is not inspiring. Hello. Of our mortality. 
that, that life here on this earth is going to come to an end. And, and everyone's going to check out. No one gets a hall pass on this thing. And the word of God, Jesus himself, makes us do these things. These four things are Jesus making us look at all of our big, fat, stinky uglies. That's what Jesus does. That's what the Holy Spirit of God does. He makes us look at our uglies. And let me tell you something. Most people don't like to do that. Most people don't like to work that stuff out. It's not fun to look at yourself and evaluate your sin and your morality. It's not fun to look at the end of your life as it approaches like a, like a roller coaster. You're going at it. Tick, 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 tick. And you know any minute you're done. Like that's not fun stuff. But the word of God, Jesus himself, he makes you think of this stuff. And that's work that most people don't want to do. It's hard, hard work. So that's why I say divides. Because some people embrace it, they read the Word of God, and they embrace it, and they want to do better. But some people read it like, eh, Heisman, I'm done. I don't want that. Not now. Maybe later on I'll pick it up and I'll check it out. But for right now, I'm happy drinking battery acid and killing myself. That's just the way I like it. So let's go back here to the text here. Go back to John chapter 9, right? Look at verses 8 and 9. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, Isn't this the man who used to sit in bed? Some said he was, and others said, No, he just looks like him. But the beggar's going, No, 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 it's me, it's me, right? No, it's me. Like, make no mistake about it. So, this, like, we read this, and we're like, Man, this guy, these guys are crazy. Think, don't blow by the text. It says that, that his neighbors, this guy's neighbors, like, they, they knew this guy, right? They knew this guy. And then others that maybe didn't live next to him, but they knew this guy. It says that they knew him. But they still, even though they knew him, what was their answer? Yeah, like I knew that he was blind. I knew this guy named Joe, whatever his name is. I know this guy. But then you inject Jesus into the whole situation. And they're like, yeah, I've known this guy for like 20 years. I know he's been blind. But, well, maybe he just kind of looks like him. I mean, seriously. That's stupid, right? Stupid. We can all look at them, we can laugh. Like, what if these guys are idiots, right? But we're the same way. We're the same exactly. Let me just, let me just bring it right into your world. Some people encounter Jesus, right? And they realize that they are truly a sinner in great need of the salvation that he and only he offers. And Jesus, what happens there? Jesus sits on that person's throne, right? And it's all good. It's all good. They, they, they have an encounter with Jesus. Like, they, they're in this scene here, they see all this go down, they're like, yeah, cool, I got it. That was Jesus, good. And, and some of us are like that, right? We have an encounter with Jesus, he invades our life, and we realize he is really the king of kings, he sits on the throne one of the universe, and I'm a sinner, and I need him to be saved, and I don't want him in my life, and we embrace him, and Jesus sits on the throne of our life. It's awesome, but yet others, just like these guys here, <laughs> they have an encounter with Jesus, they'll actually go to a church, and the preacher will preach for 20 weeks about the powerful miracles of Jesus Christ. And they'll go, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that guy walks on water. I know that he like though, I know that he created like the earth that I walk on, but I'm just not quite sure. You just want to give him a forum. You know what I'm saying? Like stupid, right? Crazy. But that's what people are. And so what, we, we, what people do is they do what the Bible says in Romans 1.18. It says that they suppress the truth in their wickedness. See, even that verse kind of stings, doesn't it? Because when we say no to Jesus, he's tempting us to do Not tempting, but I'm retrying. He's leading us to do something, and we kind of say no to it. We don't want to think of ourselves as wicked, right? Nobody wants to do that. I'm a believer. I'm not wicked. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I don't like it. It says that we suppress the truth in our wickedness and goes on to say that they know the truth, but they refuse to worship God. Who's guilty? Come on now. I am. Everyone. And this is not condemn. This, I'm not raising your hand to condemn you. I'm raising it. I'm asking you to raise your hand just so you can. That's the first step in getting better, right? Acknowledging you have a problem. So we've all acknowledged that we have a problem right now. So the only thing we can do is move on from that. We jump off from that point. We can say, God, give us strength to do better. You guys all in on that? Okay, let's just do that. Let's ask them to do better. 
Um, this is what happens. I, I want to say that it's just called stubborn. That's a good summary term. Why we say no to God? We're stubborn. This is not what the Bible says, but that's what I say. And many of you might say that, but the Bible calls us having a hard heart. In the Bible, it tells us over 40 times about people hardening their heart toward God. I don't want to read them all to you, but let me give you a sample just to, to uh, give you an idea of what the Bible talks about here. Um, Hebrews 3, uh, verses 7 and 15, identical verses. It says this, Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. Do you know that not everybody's hearing God's voice? Not everybody's hearing God's voice. That doesn't mean he's not talking. That means not everybody's hearing because you're busy and you've got a big mouth. And so you're not listening. But not, listen, if, if God's, if you can hear God's voice, I'm going to throw a non, an ugly church word out. It's not a church word at all, so I'm going to say you're lucky. You can shun me if you want, I don't care. You're lucky. If you're hearing God's voice, you're one of the fortunate ones. And so when he, this is, he's just trying to encourage you to do something, because if you heard his voice originally, you got saved, that's awesome. So you get to enjoy glory at some point. I don't know when that's all going to come down. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. Nobody knows. But there's going to be, most likely, there's a time between the time you say yes to Jesus to the time he comes back to retrieve you. So why not start heaven right there? Right? Well, why not fill in that gap? Why, why not why go through hell to get to heaven? Isn't that a, a Steve Miller song? That's, cr that's crap. Right? Why not start heaven right now? So if he's... If he's telling you something, don't say no. He's trying to help you get some of that glory right now. And you keep saying no. I keep saying no. That's kind of foolish. Here's, here's another one. Um, Ephesians 4.18. I think it should be on the screen. I want to, I want to give you a moment to, to go there. I want you to read it with me. Ephesians 4.18. How many, let me ask you this question as you're looking. Jesus Christ said in John 10.10 10, that I came that you might have life abundantly, right? Like crazy, awesome, pouring over in abundance love, right? An amazing life. So here's another opportunity. Show of hands. Who's experiencing true, abundant, pouring over, amazing life? Two, three, four, five people. Six, seven. Okay, that's incredible. Now, who thinks it can get better? <laughs> okay. So now you see a need in your life, right? God drew it right out of you, right there. Here, here's his answer. Ephesians 4, 18. They wander far from the life God gives. That's the only life can get better. Because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. You're all believers that raise your hand. I'm going to sting you. You don't believe enough. Myself. I don't believe enough. I love that book. But I just don't believe it enough. I'm a surfacey guy, just like the rest of us. We're all surface. We all believe it. I don't I love God's word. Right here. You just don't believe what it says. Remember that song? Give me faith to trust what you said. We were giving, right? We're giving the baskets going around. Right? And some of you are going, heck no, I need this. Meanwhile, he says, if you'll give, I'll bless you so much that I'll open the windows of heaven and dump on you all the blessings that you ever could need. But if you don't give it, I will curse you. And yet still, that basket comes, and when you walk by that computer, you might as well be plagued. You won't let go. And meanwhile, you've wandered from the life God is trying to give you because you've closed your mind and you've hardened your heart against it. Let's look back at the text for a second. Look at the. If I can see. It's crazy. There's like a 15, 17 years ago. It was weird. Total has nothing to do what we're talking about. I can't see, so. I was, I was uh, in the golf business, I used to play golf every day, and then all of a sudden one day I went, it's so crazy, right? Like I could barely see anything. 
You should see me trying to hit the golf ball. Wait a minute! Hitting the ground, I'm whiffing over the top of it. I mean, this is a guy I played every day. I couldn't hit the golf ball anymore. So I got fitted for glasses. He's like, yeah, you're, you're, you're blind. I mean, you just like your vision's shot. So he gave me these glasses so I could see. Two weeks later, it told me when I was blind. Yeah, it was crazy. I don't even know. I wasn't a Christian. It wasn't because I prayed. I don't understand. I don't know what it was, dude. Yeah, that's what they're doing. Yeah, look at this guy. You <laughs> see him coming in. Okay, so uh, verse 8 and 9. Let's go back here, right? What does it say? Uh, his neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, Is this man uh, who used to sit in bed? Is this guy who used to sit in bed? Some said he was, and others said, No, he just looks like him. Uh, but the beggar kept saying, Yes, I am the same one. Right? I am the same one. Like they saw it. They, they saw it. They knew this guy. Absolutely knew him. That this was the guy and he was blind from birth. They knew this guy. But yet, yeah, they had their heart toward it. Right? They had their heart, heart toward it. Look at verse 16. Again, some of the Pharisees said, this, this man Jesus is not from God. He's working on the Sabbath. Others said, but how can an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there's deep division of opinion among them. Verse 18, the Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see, so they called his parents. Like, the whole town knew that this guy was the blind guy from birth. Everyone knew it. You guys got to understand something. If you study old in the biblical times, they didn't have big cities. Like, where they were, they were little pockets of people. Like, what's in this room right now would be a town. Everyone knew this guy. It wasn't like these, they have now these mega churches, these little synagogues, where a little community of 100, 200 people in this little synagogue. Like these people knew. But they still refuse. It's my mother. I tell the story all the time. I hate to tell it, but it's true. You know, they just hold on to stuff. Like she reads Isaiah 53, where it talks about this Jesus coming, and it, it illustrates his, his birth, life, and death perfectly. And she reads it, and I'm like, who are they talking about? And she's like, I don't want to talk about it. They just, like, they just harden their heart towards the truth. I'm not jumping that's her answer. I don't want to talk about it. That's the way people are. Why do people refuse? Why are people stubborn? A couple of reasons. I think that we reduce. Let me tell you this. I think that we reduce down. I think that um, if we can't explain the miracle, if we can't explain the miracle, see, that's what our culture is now. We want to learn so much science and high education and we want to know that's just inside of us this desire to know everything and so we have all these institutions and colleges and all this stuff they want to explain it and so i think what happens is people reduce down the miracle like if they can't explain the miracle first of all then it wouldn't be one okay then they can't explain the miracle then they refuse jesus completely uh, look at verse 19 They asked him, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? They want to know why. Like, how did this happen? Explain to me how this happened. Look at verse 26, same thing. They asked the guys, well, what did he do? They asked, how did he heal you? They want to know how it happened. Explain this thing to us. And then we'll believe it. But here's the problem with that. As Christians, faith is the assurance of things unseen. It's to just go, you know what? I don't know. And I'm good with that. You know what I'm saying? Like I was talking to, a, to, to someone the other day, a good friend of mine who's also a pastor of a church in Orlando. And he, like me, he does, he's like, you know what? I don't want our church to be built on my abilities, my skills, our programs. I just want to pray like crazy, and I want to get up before our congregation and go, you know what? I don't know how this happened. Amazing. God's great. Like, and I'm like, dude, I, I said that to, them, to, to my people. I said the same thing. You're freaking me out, you know? He's like, yeah, that's what I want to be. I, want. I don't want it to be about our game plan. Just God did something. Ah! You know, I, I'm like, yeah, that's what I want. I want faith. I don't want to explain miracles. I don't want to tell you how to walk on water. People are always talking about the, the Red Sea opening, and, and, and even, they start explaining how, like, if the earth turned this much, and the moon was right here, and then this tidal waves that moved, and in theory it could happen with a strong enough east wind. I'm like, dude, who cares? Jesus opened the water. Yeah. Like, what are you trying to figure it out for? You got to pull out your Bunsen burners and stuff to figure out how this works? I mean, come on. You got, we need dissect pigs and frogs. You're going to try to tell me how the Red Sea opened. 
religion. See, Jesus doesn't fit our rules or our type, our mold, and so we have to, therefore, refuse him completely. You see here that these Pharisees said, oh, this guy worked on the Sabbath. I think that if Jesus worked on the Sabbath, we can. I don't know what saying. Um, also, look at verse 34. You were born a total sinner! You try to teach it, they throw them out. You know, these Jewish people are just awesome. I love them. It's embarrassing to be Jewish sometimes. Like, they forgot. Like, oh, you're a total sinner. You were born a total sinner. How about your great, most powerful, influential, greatest Jewish king that ever lived named David, right? You guys remember King David? Now, he wrote in Psalm 51 that I was born a sinner from the moment my mother conceived me. Does anyone think that this is funny? Or am I just the old, only Bible dork that thinks this is funny? You think it's from Kelly's Bible dork too? You were born a total sinner! King David said he was born a total sinner. But see, this Jesus guy, he doesn't fit their new rules that they've made up. This is the way religion looks. And you can't break this mold. Even though their own amazing king said, I was born a total sinner too. They were born total sinners too. But Jesus doesn't fit their mold. And so they throw him out. They're kind of funny. I got another one here that I thought was funny. You guys, just humor me. Just laugh. Just laugh. You know? <laughs> I haven't told you this story yet, dude. I mean, that's awesome. I love you for that. But, you know. Okay, here's another one I found, right? And you won't find unless you're a dwarf like me. It says here uh, in verse 28, uh, Then they cursed him and said, You are his disciple, but we're disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. We don't know where this man comes from. These Jewish folks said to them, We don't know where this man comes from, except in chapter 7, verse 27, we know where he comes from. That's what it says. Look it up. I'm not making it up. Just a couple chapters before, these same Jewish folks. Well, we know where he comes from. Now, now, because it doesn't fit their mold. You see? See how things change when it doesn't suit them? Oh, but before it didn't suit them, so we're like, well, we know where he comes from. He's just his kid. He's just Joseph's kid. But now, we don't even know where he comes from. I just think that that's kind of funny. So now's your chance to laugh. <laughs> you guys are amazing. This, that, 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 but that's what they do. The Jewish folks, these, these religious folks, they're, they're funny, man. They hold on to these traditions and, and these customs and ceremonies and crazy doctrines and beliefs, even though they have no explanation for it. That's just, you gotta hold, you gotta, you gotta guard your position. It's just the way it is, you know. It's the way we've always done it. Oh, heaven forbid we ever say that here, please. The gospel always forces a response. Every single person that hears the gospel of Jesus Christ response. Whether you think so or not, you respond to it. You have either realized your great need and you've embraced Jesus and he sat on your throne. Or, you harden your heart and you refuse. Let me just clarify something. No choice. Say, well, I'll put it off. You just made one. You just hardened your heart against Jesus Christ. And he's trying to talk to you and you said no. Delayed obedience is no obedience at all. Parents? Right? That wasn't an amen. Yeah. Here's the third thing. This is my favorite thing. But your kids are all wonderful. Right? You've always, yeah, you always listen. Right, we need to baptize you again, don't we? Yeah. I love this guy. This guy right here in the Bible is one of my favorite guys in all the Bible. It's absolutely phenomenal, right? Here's the thing. We're sitting here talking about how some people respond and some people don't. We harden our heart, we accept all that. This guy's amazing, right? He, he totally, he sees, he experiences the, the, mercy, the tender mercies of Jesus. And, and with no explanation required and no compliance to doctrine desire, this guy just simply says, verse 25, he says, I know this. I once was blind, and now I see, and Jesus did it. He's not smart. He's not some theologian that just studied and just got out of seminary and he can give you all the, the theology behind it. He's just like, listen, dude, I'm blind. 
Now I'm not. And that dude over there, he did it. That's it. I, I just, I, I was blind and now I can see. Period. Okay? Jesus did it. And you know what's amazing is that when you read on in his explanation, I just love this guy. He's, he's, he's in this confrontation with these religious people who try to explain everything away. And what does he say in verse 33? He's like, you know, kind of like, you guys don't know? Like, he's calling them stupid. He's calling them out. He's like, you guys don't know? You don't know where he comes from? Really? Like, no one's ever been able to cure a blind guy from birth. Like, if he wasn't from God, this wouldn't have happened, dude. I don't know if he used dude, but I mean, I'm just saying, if it had happened now, he may have said that. He might have said, oi. <laughs> oi, vey. No, that's Italian Jewish. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what's wrong with you. I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with you. But he would have said, oi, I'm sure. Oi, vey. Oi, vey is me. That's like, a, that's, a, that's an addition to the oi, vey. If you really get religious, just say, oi, vey is me. Want to try it? Come on, Harry. I don't even understand. Uh, there's no reduction here in this guy's statement. He, he's not trying to explain the molecular structure of the mud that Jesus used. He didn't break out the Bunsen burners and the tubes and start the little fires and the microscopes. He's not trying to, you know, just go through the, the molecular structure of the divine snot that Jesus into the spit. I mean, I mean, seriously, right? That, he's not trying to do that. He's just like, I, I don't know. I was blind and and he did this, and I, I can see now. You know, that's it. There was no religion involved in this guy. He wasn't thinking that the healing came because, because he or his parents, remember back, was like, why is he blind? Is it because of what he did? Or is it because of what his parents did? Maybe their sin? Maybe that's because that's what people think. There's a religious thing there. And so he's not saying, you know what? It wasn't that he was healed because I was obedient to all of God's laws, and so he was hooking me up, or my parents maybe were obedient to God's laws, and so maybe he was hooking them up and healing me. That's not what it was. You know what it was? Boom, that just happened. That's it. I don't understand that. Why are we not satisfied with that? Can't we be satisfied with that? Do we have to understand everything? And so this guy doesn't understand anything. He just knows that he was blind, and now we can see. And then Jesus did it. I can't explain it. Don't know why, but he did. Awesome. Right? Awesome. And see, I love this guy because he, he's not afraid when he's confronted with all of the, the power in the community and all the possible shunning. And, and they could have kicked him right out of the synagogue too. Right? But it's not like nowadays, like the center of our world is not really the church right now. But back then, it was. Like to be kicked out of the synagogue was a big deal. They must get one out of town. Right? That's what it was. Like, here now, there was one little synagogue in that town. Here, if we were in the out, you'd go across the Presbyterian church. It's no big deal. But back then, one church, one town, you get excommunicated, you're like, what am I supposed to do? What do I do? Right? It's, it's, it's rough. It's rough. And in the face of that, he just like, he's calling them out. Like, what are you, stupid? Are you stupid? You saw what he did? This is me. I mean, what? You've known me my whole life. I want you to see me sitting here every single day begging you for money. I bothered you for money, and you kept telling me no. But here I am right now in front of the same God. I couldn't see you, but you could see me. And now I can see you. And you're not, and you don't understand this? What's wrong with you? See, we gotta be able to come out and be bold, right? This guy's bold. We're not bold enough. Revelation 12:11, there's a story there at the end. Uh, in the story, and it's the enemy, the devil, he's, he's the like a battle between him and us, you know? And the Bible tells us in Revelation 12, 11, that the believers overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Okay, so, so here's, here's the picture. Um, you can't be saved. You can't, you have no authority over anything evil and demonic and ugly, okay? Nothing unless Jesus has saved you. you you're out there. You might also just be, you're just a dead man walking, Okay? So the, the way that the whole thing starts is that Jesus goes to the cross and he breaks the body and he pours out his blood for you. So that's the foundation of everything, right? That's the foundation of our faith. You've got to have that. But the word of our testimony, if the, if, the, if the blood of the Lamb is the foundation that everything is built upon, the word of our testimony, when you encourage, when Kyle said, speak up to encourage everybody else, <coughs> that's the walls of the building. Our temple, if you will, is being built up stronger and stronger and stronger by the word of our testimony. 
testimony. See, when this guy comes up and says, I was blind, but now I see, you're like, oh, the creator of the universe does that? That's awesome. And so your faith builds. So every time something happens in your lives and you get up and you speak up about it, it builds up all the other believers because they start getting a little weak in their faith, right? And so when all of a sudden Robert says, hey, man, you won't believe what Jesus did for me. I have this problem. I was blind, but now I can see. You're like, Whoa, I can trust that guy. I can trust him. Right? So the word of our testimony, it helps us. And so there has to be a time for each of us when we need to speak up. We need to speak up and tell, tell people about Jesus and his work in your life right now so other people can know his power. They can know his power to provide, his power to save, his power to create, right? We have to speak up so people are encouraged. You can't just get it from one person every week. We need to be preachers all during the community. We're a holy nation of priests presenting the word of God and Jesus Christ to everyone we come across. That's what we need to do. We all look in the Bible at guys like Paul and like, man, that guy's amazing, right? What incredible faith. He's in jail. He's preaching. He's dying. He's preaching. Like, that's the norm. Guess why that's in there? Because you're supposed to be like that. You're not supposed to stand in awe of Paul. You're supposed to be like Paul, okay? You're supposed to be like him. But here's the thing about Paul. He was trained like crazy. He knows the word of God. He knows. He spoke audibly with Jesus, right? But... In 2 Corinthians 4, 13, he says something that's massively profound. I love it. He says, I believe, therefore I speak. Like, he didn't credit his training for his inspiration or his motivation for preaching the gospel. That was, it was not what he was trained. It's not because he was trained. It's just because, you know what? I believe it. So I have to speak. I can't. How can I not speak of what I've seen and heard? He's like, I believe, and so therefore, I speak. No science, no reduction, no religion, just honest truth about the work that Jesus is doing in your life right now. That's what people want to hear. Remember Paul, when he came to people to preach, he's like, I'm not using fancy language, no fancy sermons, no Bunsen burners, no creativity, nothing. Jesus Christ and on the cross and him crucified. You're a sinner. He's God. He died for you. Say yes or you're going to hell. Boom. Done. Have a nice day, folks. See ya. Like, keep it simple. But you have to talk to people. They need to know. Amen. They need to know. So, you got to ask yourself, I'm not Paul, right? But did, did, did he save you? That's a baby. Did he save you? Do I got something to talk about? Do I have something to talk about? I mean, this guy's blind, but now I see, like, he had something, right? He had something to talk about, but did, did Jesus save you? Let's give him something to talk about. Right? Did he save you? Did he provide for you in a, one of those crazy, massive need situations where you're like, God, you either deliver or I'm going under? Did he? Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of you have had those. Mm -hmm. Did he change your heart towards someone who was despicable? Is your morality heightened? Has your mortality kind of decreased as your eternality increased? Like it didn't change your perspective on life? Yeah. You're not so much worried about the mortality stuff like the here and now, what I can have here and now. Have you shifted your thinking to treasures of heaven, keeping your mind on Christ, focusing on the things that are above? Because you weren't doing that before. I mean, honestly, right? No one was doing that. But are you doing that? That's not you doing that. Just want to take your credit away. The one who began a good work in you and continue to do so. Like those thoughts of Jesus and heaven and being nice to people, that's not you. You're wretched, and I am too, right? Honestly, nobody wants to be nice, okay? That's just, that's the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you. So, has it changed you at all? Do you have something to talk about? I don't know, maybe you don't think so. Let me give you a little bit of a, let me give you a little, just a nugget of, of observation that might encourage you. Last week, when Rob got baptized, 
in the in the lobby there. I'm standing there. I'm saying goodbye to folks, and, and and Rob comes up, and he's got his mom, and his mom's an older woman. She, I don't know. I don't know if I would call her elderly, but it's, you know, close. She's an sort of older woman, and she comes up, and she, and I, I met her. Nice to meet you, you know. And she's like, I'm just so proud of my son. And I'm like, yeah, that's good, that's good. Then she says something. It's just, you know, I thought it was big. She goes, and he visits me more now. Right? Don't just blaze by that. That's big. Right? There's a lot of old ladies that their kids don't visit them. But he does now. Why? Because God's spirit worked. God saved him. And that's evidence that God changed him. So there's something, that, there's a story in that. That's something to tell people, okay? Now, I just want to clarify that deeds and acts don't save us, but they help us to overcome the enemy's effort to completely jack up your life now. Okay, you can have Jesus as your savior, and you can have eternity promised, and that's all good, but in the meantime, in the gap, he's trying to jack your life up. He's trying to ruin your marriage, Kill your kids, ruin your business, destroy your church, ruin everything, okay? That's just the way it is. And so when, when, when something amazing happens in your life, when you were blind and now you can see, you tell people because they need to hear that. Who needs to hear good news? I need it all the time, right? Because we hear all kinds of bad news all the time. So we need to fight that thing. Mark's got two hands up. Don't know if he's stretching, yawning, or I need double good news, but I say let's go with double good news. We Amen. need some good news all the time. So here's the thing, as I, as I, I'm done, is this. I could stand before you, okay? I could do this. I could stand before you and I could, I could quote Psalm 46.1 that just simply says this. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. Like I can quote that to you, and that's the word of God, and that's awesome and good and powerful and it works. And it's alive and it can change you and you can go, yeah, he is. Now that's good. Now I'm not here to trump God. But here's the thing that God can do through you. A, a pastor can stand up and preach uh, Psalm 46.1. Again, it says this. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. Or I can stand before you, a blind man. And I can prove that Psalm 46.1 is true by saying... I was blind, and now I can see, and Jesus did it. That's powerful. No one, no one can deny that. No one, they can, you can read this book until you're blue in the face, and if someone's, listen, even that might not work for someone, but if, if their heart is hardened, you can read scripture. How many people have read scripture to their stubborn friends who don't believe? Yeah, and they still don't, right? Okay? But if you're blind and you can now see, you go throw that story in their grill and see what it does to them. Okay? That's what we need to do. Okay? If you do that, if you start sharing with people what God has done, watch their faithometer start just spiking. Right? That's what builds us all up when we share our, each other's stories. That's the kind of folks revolution folks need to be. Amen. So let, let's do this. And I'm going to ask if the uh, the guys are going to hand out communion. Someone, anyone? I don't know how it's going down. But let's let's do this as we close. Okay. I want to ask you a question. And 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 don't just be so quick to go. Yeah. Think about this for a second. Who sits on throne two right now in your world? Who sits on throne two? So I want to ask you to just take a moment, just by hand, just in prayer, just be thinking about that. Let, let the Spirit of God just minister to you whatever way He needs to. If you need to, if you if, if He speaks to you and, and you realize that He truly isn't sitting on your throne, and, and you want to confess an area of your life, or confess sin or whatever, um, I'll, I'll be up here. Um, Kyle, if you don't mind, maybe he'll be up here. And if you want to come and we'll pray with you. If you just need someone to like puke it out on and get it out and get started on the healing process and get better, we'll pray with you. But just take a moment and think about this. <coughs> Is Jesus Christ truly sitting on throne two in you? Okay? I'm going to pray and uh, if you can pass out the meeting. Um, Father, thank you for letting us.
was gathering to me. Um, sometimes I'm at a loss, don't know really what to say to you. speech everybody. I encourage your brothers and sisters now by simply raising your hand if God Almighty just spoke to you this morning. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Created the universe just spoke to twelve people.
In Isaiah 53, verse 6, it says, All of us, like sheep, have strayed. We have left God's past to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Now, I remind you, that's in the Old Testament. I won't leave that as that. You know, Jesus, he, he did a, an amazing thing for us to die on the cross for us. And this is what the communion is about. It's about the, the bread that's his body that was broken. And then the, the drink that represents the blood that covers our sins. And, and in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering just as Christ suffered. He suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate, retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed once you were like sheep who were wandered away, but no, you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. It's amazing how things repeat in the New Testament versus the Old Testament. It repeats itself. It's amazing. Now that was after Jesus walked here and died on the cross for us. We go back to this guy, one of the things that I was thinking about was my actual faith. Do I really believe I really believe that if I was to die right now, am I going to heaven? It's a scary thought to think about that. So it made me think throughout the two weeks, I need to do better. I need to love more. And that's the hardest thing to do. Where it says where we need to basically imitate Jesus that he never sinned. Well, of course we're going to sin. That's going to happen. But if we keep striving to be more like him, then we do more good than we do evil. Amen. And close on that, you know, what I want you to think about this week, it states in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. I want you to think about this week, if your faith is that strong. If you were to leave this world today, tonight, where are you going? Think about that. Think about that. So go ahead and take this bread. That represents Jesus' body that was broken on the cross. Take it and remember it again. drink represents Jesus' blood. It was spilled for us. So we can go to heaven. Quick prayer. Lord, thank you for this house, your house, for us to come in here and worship and learn your word. Thank you for all the people that are in here tonight. Please pour the blessings on us, our family, and all the virgin people that are in this world. Lead them to you. Give us the strength to go to those people and disciple those people. Give us the strength to imitate you. Give us the strength to follow you. Give us the strength to keep you centered in our lives. Don't let us wander. And if we wander, bring us back straight to you. I say these things in your name. Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.